Uh, so good afternoon. So today I want us to introduce. Good afternoon, teacher. I want us to introduce heat transfer. So this is a new element or a new item in the heat and thermodynamics called heat transfer. And we all know how heat has been transferred before. We have seen heat being transferred by conduction. We have seen heat being transferred by convection. We have seen heat being transferred by radiation. Whereby, one of the closest examples I can ask to take, take you through uh, is um, when heat is being transferred, for example, when you look at this, uh, there's an element we call, we call it the what? We call it the, the temperature gun used to detect people, people's temperature who have COVID. That temperature gun is using a mechanism of radiation, right? So it uses radiation. That's why they just direct it to your body, to your skin. And then we are able to check whether your temperature is according to what the standard requires for you to enter into a given premise. Then uh, you've seen also what we call, um, yeah, what we call uh, conduction, mm -hmm. that if you get someone and you hug someone, you feel their heat or you feel warm or you feel they're get, giving you warmth. Then also we have seen that if you get off your shoes and you step on the floor, you feel cold or you feel the feet are running cold. The reason why the feet are running cold is because the heat you have as you, the body temperature you have, that heat is being exchanged to the ground by conduction. If it's a thermometer, the thermometer can be put under your armpits, can be put in your mouth, can be put in your buttocks, can be put any place where the heat is assumed to be having a uniform distribution on your body. And in that case, it can be also conducting heat uh, by conduction through the glass then to the capillary tube where mercury is, and we can find that we have also heat transfer taking place there. Another way we can see heat being transferred is through convection, whereby convection is the transfer of heat by a fluid via a bulk vo of volume of, uh, of a given fluid. Uh, we can see heat evaporating from boiled food. If some of you cook uh, steamed matok at home using banana leaves, when they are going to serve matoki and they remove it from a saucepan, you see steam flying out of the of the what of the coverings of the food. You even see steam coming out of the matoki. Reason being, it's that steam. Steam are particles which are most energetic coming from the component which has been cooked or which has been having heat. So the most energetic ones escape. As they escape, they evaporate and leave less energetic molecules and thus whatever is remaining can end up being or becoming cold. In that way, we have also transferred heat by convection. Also, this can be seen on rivers and lakes where the sun rays heat those surfaces and we end up exper uh, experiencing what we call convection taking place. Um, we also have tea. As you take tea, you pour tea in a cup and when you check out your tea you've poured, you will see that uh, it will have steam running over the surface of the tea. So let me show you some of these illustrations and you take a look. Uh, like this one, you see it's a cup of tea. It is showing you heat. It's escaping through vapor. Sometimes what we do, even blow that vapor away. As you take tea, you, you blow a little. What you're doing, you're just making the vapor molecules move away very fast so that others can also come out very fast. When others come out very fast, the rate of heat loss increases. And this, thus, 
your tea can cool down very fast and you enjoy the tea, especially when you are going for uh, uh, rush hours in the morning, maybe you're going to be delivered at school by your parents or the school bus has come around and you want to finish your tea, you find all means of uh, making sure that you easily make the tea uh, become cool rather than being very hot. Now, another illustration we can talk about is, um, you can see this illustration. Uh, it shows you firewood below. It shows you a saucepan, maybe boiling some water. Then firewood is giving out heat and then heat is transferred by radiation to the surrounding. And that surrounding, the heat reaches the saucepan. And then whatever is holding the saucepan as a handle, like this handle you can see here, is going to transfer heat by conduction. Here, this is conduction. As you can see this illustration. Then in here, we see molecules moving around from the bottom. Those that gain heat from the bottom, they move up. As they move up and down, they are transferring heat through the fluid, which is as a result of the molecules moving around. And that is also illustrating what we call convection as a method of transfer of what? As a method of transfer of heat. Um, another one, you can see this write up says the molecular motion in fluid is the cause of convection is the cause of convective heat transfer the motion of the molecules increases when the temperature of the molecules is increased as a result the molecules tend to move away from each other the movement of the molecules is responsible for the transfer of heat let me add more knowledge there that you know heat is directly proportional to temperature it's also directly proportional to velocity when the molecules gain kinetic energy as a result of increased temperature, these molecules have the energy to move further away apart from the intermolecular forces of attraction between them. When they do so, they are in position to move further and faster away from each other. But as they move away from each other, they are going to transfer heat. That way, they are doing the job of convection in the means of transfer of heat. Ah, uh, you can see here they're telling you if you look around, you might observe that convection has an important role to play in our daily lives. For example, we are going to discuss real life examples of convection, which are quite interesting. Convection has examples like uh, the breezes, sea breeze and land breezes. Eh? For example, cool air can run from the sea, come to the land which is warm, which has been warmed up by the sun. Then when this air comes to the land, it is going to be warmed up. So these air molecules get heated up. When they get heated up, they gain kinetic energy. When they gain kinetic energy, the hot molecules rise up and they continue moving. And then they can move to this dense part of the sea and they get condensed again. Then they come back to the land and then the process can continue. That is the reason why when you stand at the beach, when you stand where the river bank is, when you stand where the edge of the lake or ocean is, you feel a cool, a cool current, a cool breeze blowing to you. That cool breeze is coming from the top of the sea as a result of convectional currents. That is during the day. Now in the night, what happens? In the night, there is no sunshine, so nothing is gaining heat. But now during the day, the water has a high specific heat capacity. The earth has a low specific heat capacity. This one I did not mention. The earth is the warms up, whereas the water takes long. That's why the breeze comes from the sea when it is cold or cool. Whereas in the night, the earth being a good conductor, at the same time, it's, it's a poor conductor, it's a poor, it's a, it's, it, it's, it easily absorbs the heat, at the same time, it easily loses the heat. So at night, the earth easily loses the heat, so it becomes cool very fast. Whereas the sea, which took longer to attain heat, has still retained its heat it had during the day. That is why in the night now, you, when you're on the earth, is, when you're on the bank and you're on the beach, the earth is cold, whereas the water is warm. So when you go and touch the water, it will appear warm. And in that case, you will feel that the breeze which is cold or which is cool is coming from the land and it is blowing towards the sea. For that reason, the water which is in the sea will warm up the air molecules above it and those air molecules will rise and they will move towards the earth. So as they move towards the earth, they will be now condensed due to the 
cold that we experience on the earth and then they become dense and then they move back to the sea as cold molecules. So that is one application we can talk about for convection. Uh, there is a write up here. I think you will uh, see how I can share with you this. There is another aspect. Look at this boiling water. Boiling water is also showing you. All of us have seen boiling water. Everyone has ever boiled water. Eh? I trust everyone, even the boys here. If you have not boiled the water, perhaps you have used the percolator, you have used an electric kettle. Yeah, in that sense, you can boil water. But as you boil the water, uh, you will see that convection plays a very big role of the water boiling. Whereby to reach the boiling point, the water has to boil in a sense that the most energetic molecules rise up to the surface. Whereas the cold molecules at the bottom gain heat from the bottom. And now when the heat, when the most energetic molecules raise to the surface, if they still have more energy, they can even escape in form of vapor, okay? So in that sense, you will see that you can experience boiling as a result of convection. Let's talk about blood circulation in warm-blooded animals. You might be surprised to know that warm-blooded animals employ convection to regulate their temperature of the body. The human heart is a pump and blood circulation in the human body is an example of post-convection. The heat which is generated by the cells in the body is transferred to the air or water, which is flowing over the skin. Now, when we are feeling very hot, when we are feeling very hot, we experience these conditions. One can go and pour some water on their body in order to feel cool. Now, when you pour some water on your body to feel cool, they have told you here that the heat is generated by the cells of the body and is transferred to air or to water which is flowing over the skin. Now, when you allow water to flow over your skin, the cells are going to, on your body, are going to transfer the heat to that water. That is why if you pour yourself on yourself that warm water, cold water, by the time it runs down, it is warm. Yeah? So the water has been, has gone down away with some heat from the body, hence you feel cold. More other examples I can give you on this is if you take hot water during a hot day, you take a hot cup of tea, you'll increase your body temperature over that of the surrounding. Now what happens is there will be heat transfer from the surrounding, from the body, which is hot, that is your body to the surrounding by radiation. And thus, when you warm up those air molecules around you, the wind will come and blow away those air molecules and you end up having, first hold on, let me first make some money here. You do not see Okay. So, also this other example is very good to look at, the air conditioner. I think when you visit banks, when you visit hospitals, when you visit serious offices, you find there an AC, which they call an air conditioner. Mm -hmm. So on a hot summer day, air conditions are usually constantly played or constantly uh, running. The process of cooling air in air conditioners employs the very principle of convection. The air which is cold is released by the air conditioners. Now this cold air is dense than the warm air and hence it sinks. The warm air being less dense rises and is drawn by the air conditioners. As a result, a convection current is set up in the room. So the air conditioner is going to absorb all the heat molecules, all the molecules which are having a high temperature or high or high heat energy. Then these ones which are being released from the air conditioner are going to remain, which are dense and cold, and then they will settle down and you'll feel cold. Also, uh, some essays use the principle of what we call entropy, whereby entropy is about heat exchangers. Those of us who have Roger Moncaster, you can read about them. Heat exchangers do exchange heat in a way that, for example, some of the air conditioners are designed to scrub out, to pick out any air molecules which are having very high heat energy, amounts of heat energy. When they do pull out some of those heat uh, energy molecules, then they will leave the room with only those less energetic molecules, which are cold and dense. And that way, the room will remain cold because of the AC being put on. Whereas the reverse is true. Some air conditioners are designed to warm. Whites who stay in snow 
have such kind of air conditioners which heat up the room. In that sense, they pick out any cold molecules and they exchange, or I mean, I mean, they pick out any air molecules from outside which are warm and then they bring them inside the room and thus the entire room becomes warmed up. In that sense, they are still using the principle of convection. So with those simple definitions and illustrations, we can now go back and see exactly what we are supposed to talk about. So the first thing we are going to see in our illustrations will be conduction. And whereby conduction, this is the transfer of heat from one place to another through a substance without movement of the substance as a whole. You are there, you are the human being, you are conducting heat from a saucepan. The whole of your body is not moving, but it is conducting heat from the saucepan. So you're conducting heat in a, from a saucepan. And in that sense, as a result of that, your whole body is not moving to make the heat get conducted, just like we have it in gases and liquids where molecules move over and over. Okay, so with that, you will see that you are conducting heat, but the entire body has not moved. So, the mechanism of heat conduction. Uh, let me take a screenshot for this. Uh, mechanism of heat conduction. Let me first send this straight up. So, mechanism of heat mechanism of heat conduction. Now, if a material is heated from one end, yeah, its atoms gain what we call thermal energy. Thermal energy comes for, as a result of heating. The word thermal comes from heat. Eh? And their vibration increases because these molecules of solids, you know, are, are fixed. So they are about fixed points. So when they gain kinetic energy, their, their rate of vibration increases when they gain more heat energy. So this can be passed. And as they vibrate, they exchange heat to the nearby or the neighboring atoms. So this heat energy can be passed on to the neighboring atoms as a result of vibration of these atoms from one atom to another up to the end of the up to the end of the conductor so with that the material would be conducting heat energy this is very uh, commonly experienced in metals as one of the key examples which can illustrate this item uh, i don't know that i'd already screenshot this let me see screen share. Stella, I'm in a Zoom class. Let me call you at three. Uh, let's hold on. Where is my WhatsApp? Mm -hmm. Okay, here it goes. So we are saying, for example, 
If a specimen of any material is heated at one end, its atoms gain thermal energy and their vibration increases. This energy can be passed on to other atoms by interatomic vibrations. In metals, there are fine electrons which are in thermal equilibrium. So when it comes to other materials, other solids like metals, for them, they have free mobile electrons, yeah, which can move. Now, when they gain thermal energy, or if they're in thermal equilibrium with the surrounding atoms, these electrons travel at high speeds and transfer vast amounts of energy from one point to another of the metal by collisions with also other electrons and atoms. Therefore, in metals, heat is carried or transferred by two mechanisms. One, mainly and majorly by motion of electrons, then two, by the interatomic vibrations of the atoms of the metals. That is why we end up saying that metals are better conductors of heat some other, than some other solids, because for them, they have two mechanisms in which they can transfer heat concurrently, of which one of the method is by motion of the electrons. And as they move, they collide with other electrons and other atoms, exchanging vast amounts of heat with them. Or the other one also is by vibration of the atomic, of the, by the atoms which are in the metal, which are in fixed positions. And in that way, as they vibrate, they exchange heat with the neighboring atoms. Whereas for non-metals uh, and liquids, the molecules are coupled together by intermolecular forces of attraction. These, uh, there are virtually no free electrons and heat is transferred from one atom to another by the intermolecular, interatomic vibrations. With that, you can also see here and talk about that. Um, this process of heat conduction is slow compared to that of metals because heat conduction in metals is mainly due to free electrons. So sometimes they can ask us to compare heat transfer in metals and liquids. They can ask you to explain why heat is transferred faster in metals than other items. So all this, this presentation can explain those questions. Then it is from here that we can have what we call the thermal conductivity or coefficient of thermal conductivity, capital K, whereby if you consider a body or a slab of material of thickness, of thickness uh, and length A, if I have a thickness, say, let me have it as a thickness, maybe D. So if this is the slab, cross-section area capital A, and it has a length L, and the heat is being conducted through the slab, come and pass out here. And at this end, it has a temperature, say theta one, as heat comes out, it has a temperature, say theta two. You will find that the heat at theta one has a greater temperature than the heat at theta two because at theta one, that's where all the heat energy starts from. So it will be having a higher temperature than the temperature at the exit here. This is point A, this is point B. This is area of the slab. Let me call it capital A also. Now at B, why is the heat not the same as at A? It's because some of the heat energy has been lost along the way as the carriers we are exchanging or we are colliding with other electrons, if it's a metal, as the carriers or as the atomic, as the atoms which are fixed in solids, we are also vibrating with other atoms. So the rate of vibration at A is higher than the rate of vibration at B. So all those account for the differences in temperature. So the rate at which heat flows, heat is true, the rate at which it flows is two over T is equal to the rate of flow of heat. If this two over T is the rate of flow of heat, like I've said, I've already showed you that theta one is very greater than theta two. Therefore, the rate of heat flow or the rate of flow of heat energy through a specimen will depend on the following factors. So these are the dependents. One, 
the cross section area of the slab. The cross section area of the slab. Two, the temperature difference between the ends of the slab or the surfaces, the cross sectional surfaces. Temperature difference at the ends. And the temperature difference at the ends is theta one minus theta two. Then the third dependent is nature of the material. Nature of the material. This nature of the material is what we have called the thermal conductivity K. Yeah, or the coefficient of thermal conductivity K. Every material has its own thermal conductivity. You take a look at an example. If you get wax, and you put it on a saucepan, which is on fire, definitely melts straight away. But for you, for you, if you get your hands and you put them there, do they melt? No. It means our body has a different temperature, uh, thermal conductivity. Wood, same story. Water, same story. Every item has its own, as in a way of how we can conduct heat. So that means the nature of the material is what predicts the thermal conductivity of that material. Another item is the inverse of the distance L between the surfaces or between the ends. Inverse of the distance L between the ends of the surface. Okay. So that difference in the, that inverse proportion of the length also predicts the rate at which heat is being lost. Therefore, the rate at which heat is being lost is two over T. And we have said two over T is directly proportional to the cross section area, to the temperature difference or gradient, and inversely proportional to the length L. Therefore, two over T is going to be equal to the thermal conductivity K. So it becomes the constant of proportionality times cross sectional area times theta one minus theta two all divided by L. So with this, you can get, make K the subject where K is what we call the coefficient of thermal conductivity. Okay. Then this quantity, theta one minus theta two over L, is a quantity called the quantity called the temperature gradient. The temperature gradient. Right? Uh, the unit of K is Kelvin per meter. Sorry, this one is SI unit, the temperature gradient. Its SI unit is. Kelvin per meter, because the length is down, the temperature is up, which temperature is in Kelvin, and then the length is in meters. So they can also ask you to derive the dimensions of K. The dimensions of K can be got by first making K the subject, which is the rate of heat flow times length divided by the cross-sectional area times the temperature difference. Then you can get the dimensions of K, which is equal to dimensions of this one. So this will give us M L squared T power negative two for energy times capital L for length divided by L squared and small t. Small t is for temperature. Okay. So the dimensions of K are meters length capital T for time times small t for temperature. So if you were to get SI units of K, they are actually watts per meter per Kelvin. So this is the SI unit of K. 
Okay. So with that, with that derivation of K and its dimensions and its SI units, you can be asked to define temperature coefficient or the coefficient of thermal conductivity. Define the coefficient of thermal conductivity. So we can define it as the rate of heat flow through material of cross-section area one meter squared and the temperature gradient and of a temperature gradient one Kelvin per meter. So we can write that definition down here and say uh, temperature coefficient or thermal coefficient K is defined as the following. This is the definition. Of K is defined as the rate of heat flow through a material of a cross section of cross section area. Area of one meter squared and the temperature gradient of one Kelvin per meter. Sometimes also we can say. It can also be defined as the rate of heat flow across opposite forces of one meter cube of a material between which the temperature gradient is one Kelvin per meter. That one, you can have it in the next page. It's right here. Oh, I haven't sent it. Okay, there you go. So the second way we can define it is also presented here and says it can be also defined as the rate of heat flow across the opposite faces of one meter cube of the material between which the temperature gradient is one Kelvin per meter. So that's another way you can define the temperature or the thermal coefficient of conductivity. Now we can also discuss what we call the rate of heat flow through lagged and unlagged bars. A lagged bar is one which has been coated with a, with, a, with a coating, which does not allow heat to flow to the surrounding. Whereas the one which is unlagged is one which is open that it can allow heat to flow to the surrounding or to be transferred to the surrounding. So that is one difference I wanted you to first get to know. But as you get that difference, let me see if I can get you some illustrations here furthermore on conduction. So some examples of heat conduction in real life, we 
can see the following images. Um, One, driving. If your parent is driving you from home and you get to touch the bonnet of the car, in the morning it is cold. When it sets off and drives you, by the time you arrive at school and you go and touch that bonnet, you feel the bonnet is hot, not so. Uh, now, here they're telling me that driving is one of the three processes through which heat is transferred from a body with a higher temperature to a body with a low temperature. This process refers to transmission of caloric energy through the body's molecules, which can be presented in solids, liquids, and gases. Um, among them, let's have an illustration here. It is loading. So as heat is being transferred from one body to another as a result of conduction, one thing we should know is that heat comes from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration during conduction. Yeah. Uh, for example, if you're to see, do you know why we put on sweaters? When you put on sweaters, yeah, you generate heat around the pump, around the heart. Remember the heart is the one that pumps heat, the blood. So by the time the blood leaves the heart, it will circulate around the entire body when it is warm. And thus you will entirely feel warm. But when actually only putting on the sweater up above your chest, but you feel you're comfortable, you will feel warmth, you don't feel cold anymore. But if you don't have one, you'll feel everything is cold. The toes are cold, they're shivering, the fingers are shivering. But if you put on gloves, you put on a jacket, only the upper part, even the legs by induction will warm up. Why? Because of conduction. So in the conduction, there is no real displacement of particles, like I told you. The transfer by conduction is invisible. A metal tool is heated when it comes into contact with fire without any changes in it. Yeah, a metal tool can be put in fire and it can become heated, the whole of it, without actually these other parts going into the fire. When, I, when we iron clothing, conduction of heat intervenes. Even when we burn with a flame, it happens due to heat transfer by conduction. So as you iron your clothes and you're enjoying to be smart, you only become smart because of physics when you use the iron box as it will transfer heat from the iron box to the, to the what? To the, to, the, to the cloth. And thus that heat energy will align the molecules of the shirt, which have been wrinkled to be facing in one similar direction. And hence your shirt, your dress will be ironed. Okay. Um, also another thing we can talk about here is uh, this shows that in our day to day, there are hundreds of examples of heat transfer through driving or dry, yeah, through driving. More examples of this process are given below. From a, co from a hot coffee cup, on containing it, hot liquids transfer the heat to the container containing them, causing the latter to warm up a bit. For example, if you pour a hot coffee into a cup, it will get hot. When you touch the cup, the cup becomes hot. Why? It's because the contents in the cup are warm or they are hot. They transfer heat by conduction because they are in contact. Conduction is all about contact. They're in contact with the cup. So by the time you touch the cup, the cup will feel hot. Why? Because the coffee inside has transferred heat to the cup. Then also, uh, I gave you an example of the flow, stepping on the flow without shoes. Then from a hot cup to our hands, heat is transferred from the hot cup to our hands still by conduction because there is contact uh, between the hands and the cup. Then from the beach to our feet, uh, the sediments on the beach absorb heat from the sun and this heat is transferred to our feet. If we walk barefoot on sand at the beach, you feel the feet are warm. That is the reason. Hot compresses to muscles. Compresses or hot water bags are used to relax muscles. The heat transferred from the compress to the skin and from there 
to the muscles. So the muscles relax. Then from the fire to the pair of tongs, when making a barbecue, instruments are used to turn the meat and that are made out of metal. These pliers come in contact with the rot series. Heat transfer is initiated. If the tongs remain in contact with the heat source for a long time, the skin of the person holding it could get injured. A pair of tongs, that's why they have designed them with either a wooden coating or with a rubber coating or with a plastic coating. But the first pair of tongs which were designed for roasting, they were metallic. And with the time people could, the, the, the pair of tongs could conduct heat from the roasteries, whatever they are roasting, whether it's meat or chicken, it could transfer heat to the pair of tongs and whoever was holding it, you could also get injuries as a result of the, as a result of such, as a result of such what? Such heat transfers. Then from the radiator to the hand, in case you touch the radiator of the car, or in case you look at radiators are responsible for producing heat to heat houses. For this reason, the surface of these devices is usually hot. If you place your hand on the radiator, it will transfer the heat and it's even possible that you will feel pain if the heat is excessive. Even the radiator of the car, if you've seen one, um, it plays a role of exchanging heat, but it has water running through it. That radiator, the heat which passes through it, the water which passes through it is heated up very fast by the heat from the engine. That heat is absorbed from the engine and the water is heated up to vapor straight away. When the water vaporizes, what happens? The cooling fins in the radiator condense the vapor due to the cold air molecules that are coming through. The, that's why the forehead of the car has holes where air enters through home to, to go to where the radiator is. So those air molecules which enter into the radiator, they find their vaporized molecules of water and then they gain heat from them. The vapor condenses back to water and the system continues. That is why for an operating radiator, which is correctly operating, the water continuously runs through the entire system without evaporating. But otherwise, by the time the water comes from the engine to cool the engine, it has vaporized. And then the radiator plays the role um, of re-condensing the vapor to water again so that the procedure can continue. But still, there is a lot of conduction that takes place there. From a hand to an ice cube, that is why the ice melts when it comes to your hands. It's because your hands are already at some temperature which is higher than the temperature of ice. And in that sense, the ice gains heat from the hand and the ice melts very fast whenever you're holding it. Uh, engine Cuff talked about it, from an iron, an iron to a shirt, from a fire to a chimney poker, from one hand to a coin. That's why even coins are cold. You touch a coin, it's cold. It's because your hand is losing heat to the coin. So the rate at which that heat is being lost, we have seen that derivation, which predicts all that. So with that, uh, I'm going to stop here for today. Then you read more about this information. You can visit Google and type in conduction or examples of real life experiences in conduction as a means of transfer of heat. Because for the next lesson, we are going to start on calculation on conduction. Unless if someone has a question. Like I said, I have a meeting at three, so I have to end the lesson. Approximately this. Okay, if no questions, I'm for the table.